mic check so I can check my levels. Sure, your name is? I'm Andy Merlis. So Andy, nice right. to meet you. My name is Rob Berry, last name B-E-R-R-Y. I'm the uh, uh, principal investigator for some new technology that NASA recently developed. We're very excited by this technology because not only does it have great applications within NASA, but outside NASA from a spinoff perspective, we've already seen multiple applications out there. Great. Okay. Um, so you were just saying about uh, external applications. First, tell me what you guys have uh, <coughs> have discovered, and then we can we can elaborate in, in the applications. Sure. What we came across is a paradigm shift in the way of uh, thinking when it comes to mitigation of events. We had a very large event, which was a, a well. We had a, what we came across was let me rephrase this. What we came across is the ability to control the way fluid and structures interact. And why this was important for us is we had a launch vehicle that had a dynamic event that now we're able to use the fluids that we're carrying along for the ride to now counteract the vehicle motion itself. So from a spin-off perspective, that applies any place where fluid and structures currently coexist. So we're not the only people who carry our own fluids. You've got aircraft who carry fluids in the wet wings or the center body tanks. You've got automobiles. You've got fluid transportation where you're carrying fluids. You've even got to go out to the ocean. You've got uh, multiple devices out in the ocean that are surrounded by fluid or even contain fluid within ballast tanks. In all those places, we've now got the capability. We, the, the government has developed this, and now we're trying to get it out to the industry of taking that mass and controlling the way it plays in the system to change the attributes of how your system behaves. So make something, something more stable or make it more go unstable. If you're trying to harvest energy, it it's so opens up a whole new realms of ways of thinking. So, and you said this is all a result of an event. Is that correct? Yes, yes. What we had was a very fundamental event of a, it was called a structural resonance of the launch vehicle. Where the, re, the launch vehicle, or Ares 1 vehicle at the time, had a dynamic coupling, what it's called. And you can go back to, if you, anybody wants to take a look at what this looks like, go back to like a uh, Tacoma bridge. Have you ever seen a video of that, sure. where the bridge sits there and oscillates? That's due to vortex shedding, the flow of air across that. That's a dynamic coupling with things going in resonance. We had a similar condition, not due to wind, but due to some internal acoustic pressure of exciting the vehicle, where the entire vehicle stack would kind of oscillate up and down. And that was happening at a specific frequency, and in, the, in that frequency is actually one that the human body is not overly fond of. It uh, gets a point where your eyeballs will go into resonance and you physically cannot see. So for our astronauts who are trying to go up on this ride on this thing, they would lose situational awareness if they were going through this. Actually, the events that we were getting to, the levels, were actually the point where they could possibly kill them or would give long-term detrimental events. So we had a, la a launch, we had a big issue here. And we didn't have a lot of ways to throw a lot of weight onto this because we're everything we threw off on this from a weight perspective was payload to orbit impact. We couldn't carry an extra astronaut. We couldn't carry the extra weight to get up there. And so it was really a tough one for the architecture to go off and deal with this. So we had a couple of very sharp guys out in the lab try to say, hey, one thing we are doing, like a lot of these other systems are out there in industries, we've got fluid just sitting here. It's part of what we do. It's part of what we burn to get ourselves, you know, provide the thrust to get up in the, uh, the atmosphere. So it's, can we use that fluid, which is going along for the ride, to our advantage? And so a couple of these sharp young guys went out there in the lab and tried different things, and they came across something that performed 50 times more than the classical way of thinking would have uh, led you to believe. So is this a, a repositioning of the fluid within the vehicle itself? I mean, how does that work? Or is that way too technical for where we want to go? <laughs> <laughs> and if it is, can you, how would you summarize that? It's actually pretty simple. The concept itself, after, we, after the observation was made, we had to go dissect what happened here. Why is this, why is this behaving? Why is this not behaving the way we think it's going to behave? And that's where when we dissected really what the physics was, it's really simple. Uh, and it comes down to ownership of the fluid. And if you imagine yourself a beach ball, and you put that beach ball down in a body of fluid, and if it contracts, well, it's, it's part of a, a larger system where you got fluid surrounding the beach ball. That fluid is going to naturally follow the contraction of that surface. You know? And because of its being a, a, a flowing medium, a flowing fluid, well, the particles near the surface, of course, are going to follow the surface contraction. Well, that, because it's, that particle's moving means another particle moving, which means another one, which means another one. So what ends up happening is this small compressibility, this ability to expand and contract, this small concept will start owning all of that fluid. It's no longer owned by the launch vehicle or the aircraft, the automobile or the ship or whatever. It's owned and controlled by this guy. So that gives us the ability now to go off and dictate how that fluid, which is now owned by this guy, 
plays back in the system. So it allows us to alter the system so we just cannot, cannot be perform or behave. So this must be, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, an exciting eureka moment, I would imagine. That was. That was a very exciting one, and that actually led to another one, too. Because of our control authority, all we had to do was control the attributes of this guy, and we could control how things played together. We observed, made another observation, which was unexpected. And that observation led to what we, a whole new class of two mass systems. Now, two mass systems have been around for 100 years. And they've been used to stabilize ships. They've been used for buildings. Uh, almost every automobile's got one. They're using aircraft, they're using helicopters. You name a system, and it's, it's a good chance a two-mass damper has been involved in it. I mean, you can go to floor vibrations. They'll put them on there. Or bridge vibrations. They'll, they'll use them there to, to alter the dynamics of, of the structure. It's one of the go-to tools that people tend to use. What we discovered, based upon this observation and, and tracking it down to what it meant, was a whole new class of two-mass system. The current ones, let's take the building, for example. you got a building here, and it's going to be exposed to the wind loads, thinking it's come a bridge again. Uh, what people would do with a classical way is a dissipation of energy approach. You put a secondary mass up here on a spring that would be tuned to the same uh, frequency as this guy. Um, so, or for these guys to work, because it's dissipation of energy, I've got to say this is a building. The building's got to start moving. So we can start transferring energy into this, this secondary mass so it can go off into resonance. And have, now you have a way to bleed energy out because relative motion will allow you to bleed it out. That's called a two-mass damper. It's all about dissipation of energy. But in order to dissipate, you've got to get energy into the system for to do that. With the controlled coupling, we take this building, we take the same amount of mass, and we just say, you want that mass to play, it only plays back the way we allow it to play. So it's transformative in nature. That's just to know the way the system behaves rather than a reactionary nature where you had to go be a, a movement or a dissipation of energy. We're all about just starting it from the get-go. What this means is compared to all those systems, which there's you know, over a thousand patents on two mass tampers out there, for all these applications out there, we've got a better mousetrap. We don't have the force and time dependencies associated with that. What I mean by that, let's take that building again. That example is for an earthquake. See, so you have an earthquake profile coming in here. It's going to be, the building's been subjected to energy, and it takes a while to get energy transmitted into the secondary mass so it can start moving and start dissipating energy out. And that takes about five seconds for that to occur. So for the first five seconds of a building, you're pretty much unmitigated. You're going along, you're building up to a large response before you can start bleeding energy out and, and getting back to the, the new response. With us, we tie this mass as you can never respond. You just, you just rock steady there. That's great. So That's it's, great. It's, it's very interesting that uh, it's very, that went we from one technical issue that we had at NASA, which was a large issue, which was a near showstopper for us, we were able to spawn that off, the, the fix of that, into two new technologies. One fundamental one to control the way fluid and structures couple, and then leverage that, and then also a whole new class of two mass system, which is going to be applicable to everywhere. And it's no longer just fluid based, this is mechanical based. So we've got both mechanical and fluid based systems now, which can be utilized. So you almost stumbled into this solution by having a problem you didn't anticipate. Which is usually the way things like this happen. This is a major game changer for a lot of these industries. Uh, we've got new ways, new attributes, new characteristics that we can go off and uh, new ways of tackling the problem here. And so it's going to open up and foster a lot of different uh, thoughts. We've already been speaking with the Department of Energy, Green Energy guys, because let's go to what some of their things are. The marine hydrokinetic guys is where these guys are. Go to the wave and tidal energy creation. What's that about? That's about using a structure and harnessing fluids or the movement in the fluid and taking the energy out from that. Well, we've got a way to control the way fluid and structures couple. So that gives us a gain knob in here to now go off and amplify that energy collection. So it's not just about mitigating stuff. It's about, this is a fundamentally different way of thinking. It's, it's, it's attributes and people just haven't thought this way before. It's actually, and it all goes back to that very simple concept about the control authority associated with a, a small device. Right there in front of you all the time. It was. It really was, yes. Robert, thank you very much. I appreciate you joining us today. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much.